It's my nerd world. Welcome to it. Depeche Mode, the podcast. On the show this week, um, I found an interesting article, a recent article talking about Depeche Mode's visit to Prague back in 1988. So I wanted to share that with you. We have some listener feedback to get to this week, and we'll continue to look back on the major Depeche Mode releases from the past. This week, we'll be focusing on the next album after Exciter, and that would be Playing the Angel. Let's get right to the show brought to you by the science fiction space opera series Embark, written by John Justice. Hey, that's me. If you're a science fiction fan, definitely go and check these books out, and it's the way to support the show. I'll talk a little bit more about the books themselves, the future stories that are coming up, why, as a Depeche Mode fan, if you're also a sci-fi fan, you should check these books out as well. But you can go to Amazon.com, search for John, J-O-N, Justice, and Embark. You can find the books there. And again, I'll have a little bit more details later on in the show. My Nerd World. It is Depeche Mode, the podcast, your weekly look at all things Depeche Mode, even when there isn't a lot of news to talk about. I find things to talk about, specifically past Depeche Mode releases. Right now, we're working through all of the major albums that have been released in chronological order. Once we get past all the albums, I do have some other ideas of some other topics we're going to be covering and other things to look back upon, looking at B-sides and the video releases, subsequently the ancillary albums the people are people album the singles album things of the of that nature if you have any suggestions for topics that you'd like me to cover on the show as always talk show nerd at gmail.com or if you're listening to this on my youtube channel for my nerd world you can leave a comment right there on on youtube so a couple of programming notes uh, I think I'd mentioned before, I've been doing, I do my Star Wars podcast every week, and I've actually split the the, uh, the Star Wars podcast up into two shows, just because the, the show was getting too long. Um, I get a lot of listener feedback for the Star Wars podcast, and so I split it up between a listener feedback show, which will come out on Thursdays, and then the regular main show, talking about all things Star Wars, which comes out on, um, on Saturday. Um, that is usually a video version. I'm going to pull that back a bit. And uh, keep it an audio version for right now, just because we don't have any any new visuals to go and look at. I only bring that up because I intend to continue to do the weekly Depeche Mode show. And when when it warrants it, I, I will be adding into that perhaps a video element when the time comes. Especially when we start getting some new material, um, album artwork and videos. Um, I'll definitely do be doing a video version up on, on YouTube. Right now it's just not conducive for it. And because of the number of shows that I'm doing apart from my full-time job as a radio talk show host here in Minneapolis on uh, Twin Cities News Talk, the Justice and Drew show, um, it just makes it easier if I just stick to doing the podcast version right now. Also, one other thing I want to note, and this is a bummer, but uh, if you listen to last week's show, I added a lot of audio to it, um, specifically talking about the album Exciter. Um, I added in a 10-minute a portion of the documentary that was included on the, the remastered re-releases, and I got dinged a bunch um, on YouTube. Uh, my show was completely demonetized. I got a bunch of copyright warnings. They didn't take the show down, but it definitely sort of limited some of the incentive that I have um, uh, for these shows. I mean, obviously, I do these as a labor of love, and the only thing that I ask in return from you, the listener, is if you want to support the show, uh, is support my um, my attempts to be an author and my science fiction books, especially if you're into, into sci-fi. Uh, I don't do Patreon right now. Uh, I might in the future, but I don't. Uh, but I also get a little bit of money off of AdSense uh, and from doing the podcast in and of itself. And if I can't monetize the YouTube one, then that's a bit of a bummer. So because of that, I kind of have to sacrifice having any Depeche Mode audio on the show, which I know is a big bummer. It is for me too. But at the same time, I'm fearful that even if I were to continue to break the copyright rules and they just demonetize my show, um, that eventually they'll end up not putting it up on YouTube at all. And that's not going to be a benefit to 
uh, anybody. So I just wanted to kind of let you know that, you know, I tried it last week. It was a bit of an experiment. I was I was happy to do it. I wanted to add in the extra audio, but unfortunately, um, I just couldn't. I might try to squeak in interviews with the band that don't have any copyrighted material on it when the time comes. And so I, I, I do still intend to do that, but I just I wish I could go and include the music in there while we talk about the albums. But again, like I just explained, I get demonetized on YouTube and I'm afraid they're going to pull it completely. And that, again, would be of no benefit to to anybody. So heading into the show this week, obviously, I want to spend some time talking about uh, playing the uh, playing the age, uh, the angel. Uh, it's a, it's, again, an album that upon revisiting because I hadn't re- re- revisited it uh, it in a while, um, I kind of rediscovered it again, and in a really good, positive way. So I'm going to share that experience experience with you as well. And that's part of what's been really fun for me as a Depeche Mode fan, and as I've mentioned on previous shows, is for me, I listen to music differently than I did when I was younger, right? Sort of in the, uh, especially during the 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 core peak years of the band around that black celebration music for the masses, you know, violator songs of faith and devotion. Um, you know, I'd made mixtapes and eventually mixed CDs, but for the most part, I just stuck to listening straight to the CDs themselves. And now, you know, with our smartphones, we make playlists and I listen sporadically to songs on all kinds of, you know, on all the different albums. So it's, it's really fun for me to go back and rediscover the albums and and then go, oh, man, you know, I haven't listened to this from top to bottom. I may have listened to certain songs. Precious, for instance. I want it all. I'm a big fan of that of that particular song. A pain that I'm used to, I love, and we'll get into that. Um, but rarely have I been listening to the album beginning to end. And so going back and listening to play, Playing the Angel, again, like I said, it's like rediscovering uh, the album all over again. So I'm looking forward to getting, to getting to that portion of the show, and then we'll get to some listener feedback. But what I also do on the show is I go on to the Googles, I go on to on, onto the internet, and basically look to see if there's been any new articles that have been posted. There was quite a bit of stuff that came out around the time when the announcement was made about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, and I've shared some of those with you on the show. Uh, but oftentimes I go in and let's just see what's you know what pops up. And this was one of those moments. Um, I found an article that's not that all that old. I think it's just from the from the past like month or so. Um, by the uh, by, the outlet in Prague, um, in the Czech Republic, uh, the Prague Morning. That's the that's the uh, the publication, and the uh, the article was titled "When Depeche Mode Visited Prague in 1988." And it's so interesting to me because even something like a year that bears no specific significance. To Depeche Mode, right? I mean, like the year 1988, it's not exclusive in any way, shape, or form to Depeche Mode. But you and I both know that when it comes to 1988, that was a big year for Depeche Mode. And so whenever I see the year 1988, I can't help but immediately think about Depeche Mode. That era surrounding music for the masses, what the article talks about here, the visuals done by Anton Corbin, um, and then the years that followed in 89 and the release of the 101 documentary. Uh, and again, I, it's just it's interesting to me to see another example of the way that Depeche Mode impacts my life uh, and how I, I would not have expected it to be in that way. Because I saw 1988 and it's just like Depeche Mode. Music for the masses, you know, that's that's immediately strange love right behind the wheel. That's just what pops into my head. So here's the article here. Uh, The Czech Republic was still struggling with the communist regime back in 1988. And Depeche Mode were one of the very first bands from the western part of the world to come and perform in the country. The interest in this concert was overwhelming. And there were thousands of people coming from abroad. The capacity of the venue, the sport aton, uh, the sport, sportovni, sportovni hala, sportovni hala. My apologies. I actually worked on trying to pronounce that before I started the show. The show today, uh, I did a great job, didn't I? The uh, sportovni hala uh, was sixteen thousand seats, but there were about ninety thousand plus requests for tickets. 
the people at the art agency uh, Prago Concert were afraid that the venue was going to get damaged by ra- uh, by raging hordes of people and that the concert would become regrettable. The ticket sale was enormous. Thousands of thousands um, uh, uh, tickets were sold. I'm sorry, this, there's, some, there's some translation here, so it's a little hard to read. Thousands of thousands were sold, and 90,000 requests were received at this particular concert agency. Overall, more than 250,000 people wanted to go to the concert. Interesting amounts considering that the Depeche Mode albums were not sold here, and the music videos were not broadcast. However, the performance of the concert was absolutely free of trouble in the end. A few months later, the band visited Prague again. This time, uh, Andrew Fletcher, Martin Gore, Alan Wilder, and Dave Gunn did not perform on stage. They came just to dot, 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 visit Prague, exclamation point. Their photographer, Anton Corbin, shot these incredible series of pictures. And the pictures are very typical Anton Corbin. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of these photographs are the ones that made it into the into the tour program, if not for Music for the Masses, but maybe even Violator as well. And there was a book that came out. And I remember, and I, I, I have it somewhere. But I remember now, there was actually an Anton Corbin book that came out for Depeche Mode around that era. And I recognized a lot of these photos. I mean, Anton Corbin's work with the band was truly, truly incredible. I mean, it still continues to be. But again, during that period of time, from the standpoint of, you know, being a a 20-something Southern California native, massive Depeche Mode fan, and not really knowing anything about photography not really caring that all that much about art beyond the music that I listen to. Seeing these unique photographs by Anton Corbin was was something really important to me growing up and understanding the visual component to what the band brought and what Anton Corbin brought to the band and how a good and I know this is going to sound ridiculous but remember as a 20 something who wasn't into art or photography it challenged me in the best possible way in the way that art should because even photographs that were that were out of focus right where one member of the band was in focus the rest of the band was out of focus or you had somebody who was central in the photograph like Dave up front he's out of focus and the rest of the band is in focus and the the graininess to Anton Corbin's photography and the way that he captures emotion, especially in black and white. It's, it's equally powerful in color. And I guess the first thing that pops into my mind is the, the video for, for world in my eyes and the photographs on the, um, the VHS release for strange Two. I wish they would put strange and strange Two out on DVD. That would be just fantastic. But the 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 color photographs from the Violator era of the the drive-in movie theater and the marquee out in front that had the falling letters and and the the red classic Cadillac that Dave and the girl are, are driving in. So Anton Corbin's color work was incredibly striking, but the black and white that he did with the band was truly incredible and really taught me sort of the difference between this is a great photograph and this is a piece of art. And as a fan of the band, it it put the band in a different light. And their music was already obviously of utmost importance to me, still continues to be, but at the same time, now I've got this visual representation and an artistic visual representation of the band. And it's funny too because when Anton Corbin would go and do work with like you too, um, I was so biased at the time, probably still am now, but I was so biased at the time, like on the work on Actong Baby, Anton Corbin shot the, shot the photos for that. And then it was like, yeah, it's not as good as Depeche Mode stuff though. Yeah, it's just you too though. That's not as good as Depeche Mode. I just remember, I just, uh, the, the young, the, the young snob in me <laughs> who would go and say, oh, you too's not Depeche Mode. And that's fine if Anton Corbin's shooting photos for them, but whatever, the Depeche Mode photos are much, much better. But getting back to this this article that I found, I just thought it was really unique, these little stories that you get every once in a while, and remembering the rabid fandom of the band back then, and 
You know, it's funny the way things work because if it wasn't for that rabid fandom um, that so many of us had that are, you know, in their 40s, you know, in their in in their in the second half of their 40s, like I am, um, and then having that translate over to our to our families and our children. Now, my 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 sons aren't into Depeche Mode the way that I am, and and I doubt that my, either of my sons are going to get really into any band the way that I did back then. We just live in very different times now, and. There are still massive fans of, of bands, but it's so diluted because of so many different options and the ability that you have to to go in into your phone and listen to virtually anything at any point in time if you pay for like an, an Apple Music subscription. Um, and that, to me, it's a great thing, right? You can ex- get exposed to a lot of music, but there was something about that era of Depeche Mode when I was growing up during during 1988 and, and 90 and, you know, 91 and, you know, and, and 1994 and all that where... Uh, it was just the radio and the physical releases, and you were you were limited in the amount of music you got you got exposed to because you needed to be exposed to it. And if you didn't listen to other radio stations, why would you get exposed to other music unless you were listening to America, you know, America's Top Forty or whatever? And it really bolstered the appeal of a band like Depeche Mode and how unique they were. Um, because there wasn't anybody out there that sounded like it. And the few bands that actually made it onto the radio that sounded even close to being Depeche Mode were just compared to Depeche Mode. But it's because of that level of fandom and that rabid fandom going all the way back to 88 that the band has been able to retain their fandom to this day. And this is the type of sort of scenario that's that's often repeated and talked about more often when you look at your... You know the the bigger bands of the world, your Beatles or your your Rolling Stones, right? Uh, the Grateful Dead. I mean, you know, I mean, there's just there's a handful of those elite bands, and for alternative music, Depeche Mode fits into that category of the one of the biggest, if not the biggest, alternative rock band ever. And of course, now they're being honored as such in the uh, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But going back and listen and, and looking at this, I'm reminded of the the warehouse signing, you know, at, at uh, in Los Angeles, you know, over over Violator and. The other part of the story, too, that stuck out to me was the fact that it was interesting uh, considering that Depeche Mode albums were not sold there and the music videos, videos were not broadcast. And I remember on one of the uh, one of the fans that was documented in Spirits in the Forest had talked about that fact, about how he couldn't get Depeche Mode music. He just can, can't get it, you know, via bootleg. And I imagine for that area and that region at that point in time, those those young people exposed to the music, it was probably a somewhat active rebellion that they were able to get the band, the band's music out, you know, from outside of the country into the country. And considering the nature of the music that Depeche Mode creates, you can you can really begin to understand how appealing the band would be and how important and influential and meaningful the band would be for those young people living um in that part of the world during that period of time. Again, you can email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com, or leave a comment up on uh, up on YouTube. Let's talk about uh, playing the angel, right? Uh, going through all of the albums in chronological order, uh, and we land on this gem. Now, it's funny because when I, when I talk about the band a lot and I talk about the albums, I, I probably would be... I probably would be quicker to go and talk about a, an, an album like like the last show, like like Exciter, or Sounds of the Universe, which I'm really looking forward to to talking about on the next episode. Um, I really really love that album, and that album has really grown on me and become one of my favorites over a long time. Um, I probably wouldn't mention playing the Angel right up front, but then spending time with the release again. I kind of question as to why that is. I think part of it has to do with the point in time in my life when the album was released. I was living in Grand Rapids, Michigan when the album uh, came out. Uh, I remember going and and seeing Depeche Mode in Detroit at the time, traveling to Detroit when they came through for for that tour. Um, but that was a bit of a that was a bit of an adjustment period for me. I had left Atlanta. Um, my wife, Melinda, I think probably had just gotten pregnant with our now 13-year-old son, Kyle. So that sounds about right. You know, Logan was just a few years old at the time. I was working in a job at a radio station that wasn't the most ideal situation for the rock station I worked for. And it was during this period of time within the these years around this album that I actually ended up leaving uh, rock radio and um, ended up 
going over into talk radio. And I won't get in. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of my radio career. I'm here to talk about Depeche Mode. But I think a part of that and a part of the reason why playing the angel isn't top of mind for me is that while the album was still an important release for me at the time, and honestly, um, going back over it um, was like so many of Depeche Mode's albums was a, a, a friend that I needed at the time. It was very cathartic for me at the time to listen to this album and it helped me get me through some, some difficult times. Um, there's a lot of periods and moments in, in time during that time period that I've kind of shut out. And I think with that came, um, or comes, you know, Depeche Mode and playing the angel because revisiting it for the show this week, I, I was reminded of, of how much I actually love this album. Uh, and I'm going to work in reverse order right now. I actually have the, uh, I have the CD in my hand. And um, Depeche Mode, I mean, depending on the year that albums get released, right, the CD packages always kind of change, um, you know, and, and it depends on the on the release and what Depeche Mode is actually putting out at the time. Um, this one here is a clear plastic case, and it's a it's it's a, it holds a double disc because this version that I got was the special edition that Ox that that also has the short documentary on it, which I thought was really cool of the making of of uh, of playing the angel. Um, I really liked Anton Corbin's work on this album, too. Uh, I know I praised Exciter last week to the nth degree, and for me, personally, justifiably so, because I really like the the artwork that's on that album. Um, but Playing the Angel is really good, too, and it really is indicative of the music that's on the release itself. Uh, the font that Anton Corbin uses is very Corbin and therefore very Depeche Mode. The um, the Feather Man on the on the on the cover and sort of the the block of gray and white, very stark, uh, very industrial in my mind. But it works so well, especially with that deep sort of maroon red that he uses for the Feather Guy at the front. I just really like that imagery uh, imagery quite a bit, and. There's a couple things that I get really excited about when Depeche Mode does. I loved back during the um, Music for the Masses era and the Black Celebration era of when they'd have those little phrases, and I use them on the show a lot, you know, um, the the world we live in and, and life in general, right? Spreading the news around the world. These were these little taglines that would show up on the liner notes. They would show up on the album cover. They would show it up, uh, show up on the official t-shirts when the concerts rolled around. And when playing the angel came out, I remember flipping it over and it's got this, this really cool Anton Corbin esque group shot of the band. Dave sitting down with his slip on shoes and his white pants and his, his, uh, his white tank top, right? Um, you know, tattoos exposed, and then you got Martin and uh, and Andy in the background. Andy, of course, is standing up straight with his chin up because he doesn't want to show his double chin at the time because he was starting to put on weight because that's what happens when we get old. Um, but a great photo of the band in the back. The um, specific style of font that Anton Corbin used for the track listing. But then at the very bottom, and again, this is the special edition, so it actually has the DVD details on here too, the Playing the Angel in 5.1 in stereo, making the angel, the precious video is on here, uh, clean bear, and there was a photo gallery on the DVD too. But right underneath that, and this is what I wanted to mention, was in quotes, pain and suffering in various tempos. On the documentary, the band talks about that. How I guess one of them was asked to describe the the, the record, and and it might have been Martin, probably it was Martin, and he said, uh, "Well, you know, the record is pain and suffering in various tempos. That's kind of what Depeche Mode does." But I was so excited to go and see that added to to the album again because it really harkened, it really it harkened to that time, specifically during that Black Celebration and Music for the Masses era, where I loved those little tiny, little extra things the band would do that added to their mythology. And that's an aspect of the band that I haven't touched upon before. And I'll mention it briefly here and then maybe spend some other time on it. And certainly I'll do that when I end up talking about Alan Wilder. I know I haven't done that yet, but I decided that my my show that focuses on Alan Wilder really needs to be its own show and not lumped in with um, looking back at the at the albums during these during these revisits, right? But Depeche Mode has a mythology to it, and mythology in storytelling and fandom is really, really, really important. 
And I'll give you a, a bizarre example. The easy example is Star Wars, right? The bizarre example is the Fast and Furious movies. Now you're probably going, what? So we were talking on our show today that there's been ten Fast and Furious movies. Well, okay, there's been nine. There's a there's a there's another one coming out to make it ten, and that's including the spin-off movie Hobbs and Shaw. Um I have grown up. I mean, I remember the first time I saw the first Fast and Furious movie living in Corona, California, uh, at a time when that when that type of car culture was really, really relevant. And as a matter of fact, it's Fast and Furious that did a lot of in, that that I drew a lot of inspiration from for my science fiction space opera series, and I'll talk about that here in a little bit. But a weird thing happened with the Fast and Furious franchise because you wouldn't think that those movies would have mythology, but they do. And the characters in that and the storylines that run through it, they built and they built and they built. And now it's like those films have their own language to them. They are ridiculous. They are completely unbelievable. And they are fantastically fun. And I love going and seeing them because they've built their own. They've built their own mythology to the point where the latest trailer even shows a character that everybody thought was dead that people I know have been speculating on. I don't spend any time on Fast and Furious forums, but I know that this has been something that's been talked about a lot. What happened to this character? I thought they were dead. How are they back? And why are these films so important? It's because there's a mythology behind them. Depeche Mode created their own mythology, and they've been doing it for decades. I don't even think they've realized that they've done it. But they really have. It's in the music. It's in the band members, those that founded the band and left, those that were with the band and then left. It's in the songwriting techniques, the addition of Dave Gaughan adding his own songs to Depeche Mode's, you know, releases. Certainly the case with playing with playing the angel, the drama behind the scenes of the band and the struggles that the band has had has had. I imagine if you're listening to the show. You're a pretty hardcore Depeche Mode fan, and you probably know a lot of Depeche Mode's history. That history is mythology. And there's there, there's that aspect of it that I think is what continues to really be so appealing for us as fans is because it just goes so much deeper than just the music. It is a lifestyle. I've said that before. But there is a genuine Depeche Mode mythology to, you know, to what they do. And for me, it's the kind of thing where, you know, much like Star Wars and how much I love Star Wars, I love all of Depeche Mode. I love some songs more than others. Some songs I'll hardly listen to, right? But there's very few songs that I'm going to say are bad. Even a song that's notorious to the band, like It's Called a Heart, that the band has openly said they can't stand and they hate it. Um, the the conversations the band has had about around but not tonight and how they were mad at the at the at the US record label for releasing that overstripped because they spent a couple hours working on but not tonight but they spent weeks upon weeks working on stripped and yet the record label decided to go with but not tonight uh you know what as a fan i don't care i love that song it's called the heart is it a strong song musically eh, not really i love that song though that song means the world to me because I'm a hopeless, romantic, emotional wreck half the time. Uh, and for as weird as it sounds, I've had two open heart surgeries. And so anything as it relates to the heart is very meaningful to me. So it's called The Heart, you know, uh, is a song that resonates with me a lot. And a lot of the reason why all those things are there, it's because of the mythology of the band, right? My love of the band and what their own mythology and their own story says, and how that story speaks to us. There's a story around playing the angel. When playing the angel came out, for those that don't, um, well, let me get to this part of it. Let me st let me start here. So I remember when once again we knew there was going to be a new single coming out from Depeche Mode. Didn't know when it was going to be released. Didn't know what it was, you know, what what it was going to sound like. And I'll never forget the day when it actually leaked, because usually this stuff leaks online before it makes it out officially. And Precious leaked online. 
there were a couple of there, there's always these ridiculous um, fakes that used to pop up a lot for those that were on like Napster and LimeWire and the torrent websites where you would download music at the time. Uh, there were always all kinds of fakes that would pop up. This is Depeche Mode and it wasn't Depeche Mode. It was some band or some dude trying to sound like Depeche Mode and he released a record. And of course, as a fan that wants to hear new Depeche Mode music and is clamoring to hear Depeche Mode music, we'd always go, ooh, I want to go and hear this. I want to go and hear it. And then I'd hear it and i go, that's not Depeche Mode. And then when you actually heard the real Depeche Mode song, in an instant you went, that's Depeche Mode. That's the way the Precious was for me. And I'll never forget sitting in the, um, sitting on the ground floor, right? Because uh, it had a basement in my house in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It had a finished basement, and there was a couple bedrooms down there. That's where I had my office and my computer. And I remember it leaked, and I got a copy of it leaked. I remember sitting there um, in front of my iMac computer and playing uh, Precious for the first time. And hearing that strong signature Depeche Mode, burn, 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 I mean, the word music to my ears, right, doesn't describe how heavenly that sounded. Especially after Exciter, because Exciter was void of sort of that strong, you know, the strong beat and the strong keyboard and something that was more... Um, akin to Violator, right? I just I love sonically how Violator sounds, how crisp and bold it is, and that was largely because of the producer Flood, and this was largely because of Ben Hillier. And what I really think the producer Ben Hillier was trying to do, even though in the uh, well, not even though he did in the documentaries, he would talk about how he wanted this album to have to be a little bit dirtier and a little crunchier in his mind. It really is kind of an interesting hybrid of. Songs of Faith and Devotion, little bit of Exciter and Violator. It, it it really sort of had that, you know, an ultra to it. It was this, but it was, but then in and of itself, it was all something fresh and, and new. Um, I tend to prefer crisper, cleaner Depeche Mode. I would describe a Violator as being crisp and clean. Um, I would say the Songs of Faith and Devotion and Ultra a little less so. Um Exciter is certainly clean and crisp, but again, it sort of lack, la uh, lacks the strength. And what Playing the Angel did was kind of bring that all together for a very interesting and unique record. Um, the opening track of A Pain That I'm Used To, uh, I really enjoyed because it reminded me a lot of I Feel You. And it kind of those 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 opening tracks on Depeche Mode albums, um, probably Dream On excluded because that was a softer track. But... I often look at those opening tracks as it's it's weird to say they're not songs to me. They are, but because they're the track that opens the album, there is just something special and unique to them. And a pain that I'm used to was certainly that. Um, reminded me a lot of of songs of faith and devotion, the way the tempos changed up and the and the way that the music uh, shifted around. But I really did. Um, and I do, I really love that song. The remix of the song and the version they do live now, I think is absolutely fantastic. John, the revelator is a mixed bag, for, uh, a mixed bag for me, uh, in the same way that spirit is from a resonating with the lyric standpoint, love the song from a musical aspect of it. I think it's really unique. It's got that very preacher vibe. It's an ode to that style of music. And one particular person in, in, in particular that Martin was kind of dr was drawn to as inspiration. There was another song, John the Revelator. Um, but at the same time, it's not necessarily a track that I go and seek out. Listening to the album, it pops on and I'm rocking out to it and I love it. But if I see it on a playlist, it's not one that I'm immediately going to going to gravitate towards. And I actually have been trying as of late to do that a little bit more often. That there's a song that I see and I go, oh... Yeah, I don't know. I uh, Oftentimes I'll go, you know what? My hesitation is drawing me to it. Let me listen to it. And I end up surprising myself of how much I end up enjoying it where my mind's kind of playing tricks on me. Um, Suffer Well, Dave Gontrack. Love Suffer Well. Really, really love that song. Uh, I thought the video that went for it was very Anton Corbin, was, was different and quirky and weird like it is. But for a Dave Gon track and for Dave Gon to kind of finding his own voice in in his own music, I really thought that Suffer Well was an incredibly strong, strong track. You move over to um, The Sinner and Me. 
I enjoy The Sinner in Me. It's not my favorite song on the album by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I do like the end of that song and how it does what later Depeche Mode would do again with um, with Cover Me, where it's got this... It's got this ending that kind of goes on further and builds up and builds up. Um, And again, one of the songs that upon listening to it, I was like, oh, I forgot I really enjoyed this song, but not one that I'm going to immediately gravitate uh, towards. Uh, And then you get to Precious. I've mentioned Precious. I think, you know, Precious is a classic. There's no denying that whatsoever. It is a fantastic song. It's a heart-wrenching song in all the best possible ways. Um, And I just can't say enough, enough good things about Precious. Absolutely love that tune. Uh, macro, you know, macro is a Martin Gore track that doesn't do a lot for me. And neither of the, um, neither of the Martin Gore tracks on this particular album do a whole heck of a lot, a lot for me. Uh, I feel like Martin was kind of doing what Martin wanted to do. Uh, and it was certainly fitting for the way the album sounds in and of itself, but I don't know. I, I just kind of felt macro was one of the, what was, was a weaker, uh, a weaker Martin track. Um, really, really like I Want It All. Um, there is just something about that song that that speaks to me. Um, I like the pacing of it. Um, it too, it's a long song. It's got a quite quite a bit, of, you know, quite a bit of a tail at the end of it. But um, another good and interesting track by the band. It's an album track, but it's a but it's a real solid one. Uh, Nothing's Impossible is another one that I really enjoy, but none of these, none of these songs are making for this particular album an album that, for me as a fan, is amazing from top to bottom. And that to, that is where the difference lies with me when it comes to those previous albums. And we'll start with some great reward, but again, we're really focusing on Black Celebration. Music for the Masses, Violator, and Songs of Faith and Devotion. And I know they say I know I say the trilogy, Music for the Masses, Violator, and Songs of Faith and Devotion, but it really is a quadrilogy because I think Black Celebration needs to be in there as well. I put all four of those albums in a very special category because for me personally as a fan, and I know everybody's different, art is subjective that way. But for me as a fan, those four albums beginning to end are completely solid. And... There's very few albums beyond that that I can say that about with the, with the band. And Playing the Angel was one of them. Love the album. You know, we'll get to Delta Machine and we'll talk about that. Probably one of the, in, in my opinion, probably one of the, the weakest Depeche Mode albums um, that they put out. Again, from my opinion. And we're all different about that. And I certainly want to hear from from you. And I would never judge anybody for saying, I like Delta Machine more than I like, you know, Ultra or Songs of Faith and Devotion. Man, it's all... That's what I love about the fandom and what I talked about on the previous show is that we don't put each other down. We, you know, we celebrate Depeche Mode, even though we have different musical tastes. But like those albums, I mean, those songs, a macro, even though I love I Want It All, Nothing's Impossible, um, you know, Introspector and then and then Damage People, you know, they're good songs. But again, they just don't have the same quality or I probably a better way to put it they don't speak to me the way that previous songs of Depeche Mode have on 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 past albums. Um I do like Damage People quite a bit over Macro. Um the stronger of this era of Martin Gore tracks. I think Damage People is a, is an interesting track. Um but to add to what I said earlier for me personally this album also carries a lot of weight to it from and a lot of baggage doing that thing with my fingers just because of that time period that I was living in. Um, but listening to it again before this album, my opinion hadn't changed all that much, but I did find some better appreciation for some of these songs that I hadn't listened to in a long time, and Damage People was one of them. Um, Lillian's a fun track, uh, an interesting track. I always find songs that mention women's names directly to, to be a little bit a little bit different. What if you didn't know a Lillian, <laughs> right? Uh, and it's superficial, but it is a good track. I like I like the pacing of it. Uh, it's a it's a a, a, a lighter track, comparatively speaking, to the uh, to the rest of the album, and then you get to the darkest star, and I I really like the darkest star. Uh, it, it's a great closer to this album. Uh, I still feel like this was a band that was a bit in transition, especially having a new producer. Um, the darkest star is a darker song. Uh, the pacing of it's a little slower, but I just 
really like the way it kind of grows and grows. And it's just, it's one of the better closers for a Depeche Mode album. Um, I will say that. But for me, I feel like this was an album where the band was still looking to prove something. Uh, perhaps wasn't all that happy with Exciter. Uh, and I know that the band, or at least the, the, the way that Sounds of the Universe, which we'll talk about next week, has been looked upon. There's quite a bit of negativity sort of pointed at that album that the band seems to be disappointed with it. And I love that album. But again, it's all it's all subjective. Uh, but I really like the way this album closed. and I And I feel like... For me, because I like Sounds of the Universe so much that this was the band sort of trying something a little bit different, hearkening back to the past a little bit with branching out a little bit, making the sound a little bit more, a little more dirtier, as Ben Hillier would uh, would say. Um, but at the same time, not reaching the heights that they had before. But again, we're talking about a Depeche Mode album, so it's like pizza. Pizza is... Pizza is just, it's good, even if it's not great pizza. It's still fantastic. And this is still a Depeche Mode record, and hands down, probably, in my opinion, better than any other album that I would have listened to or uh, or purchased that year. And it's funny, too, um, I just now realize that I'm, I'm holding the disc in my hand, and a part of the label sticker is still on the album itself. How in the world, after all these years, is there still a label sticker? Or, you know, the little the little protective seal? How in the world did that happen? That's just that's just strange. Um, the other story I wanted to share about this album before we get into listener feedback this week, and I'm actually pulling out the liner notes right now because I wanted to look at them really quick. Yeah, the photographs in here. Oh, Anton Corbin's work. Seriously, Anton Corbin put Dave Gone in this ridiculous 70s sedan that's white and just, just beat her car. If you saw it on the side of the road, you probably wouldn't think it would run. They're standing in front of some faded, looks like barn doors in black and white, and they look like three badasses. It's just amazing. <laughs> just the what Anton Corbin can do with a, with a photograph. It's just truly, truly incredible. And these pictures are, are no different. The last picture in the liner notes, by the way, it's the, it's the three band members in front of what looks to be a three-story seedy hotel. And there's space kind of eat the sort of diagonally in front of, you got like Andy Fletcher, who's got a profile shot in front of a door, and then Dave Gone in the middle, in front of a set of windows with sunglasses on, and, and Martin Gore in front of a door at the bottom on the left, um, in a profile shot. And you look at this and go, it's a building with three dudes. And yet when you go, it's Depeche Mode as a fan, I go, I want it framed in a picture. <laughs> I also like on the inside too, where it's all blacked out behind where the uh, where the discs go, and it's got the little the little feather dude. There's a regular name for him, right? Didn't people have a name for him? I know people have gotten tattoos of him before, but um, I thought there was a name for that for that guy. All right, one more quick story, and then we'll get to listener feedback this week. For those that remember, and it's funny when this kind of stuff happens. the The working video for Precious got leaked. For those that remember. Somehow, somebody at the studio ended up leaking. It was the Precious video. It had the band in there, but the effects weren't finished yet. And it was a really interesting video because of that. I mean, Depeche Mode and Anton Corbin, and it wasn't Anton Corbin that shot that video. I can't remember who it was, but I really liked the Precious video a lot. I think it's pretty rad. But I remember when this working print of the album came out and of the um, uh, of the video and I remember watching that thing over and over and over again, and it was actually kind of cool, even though it wasn't complete. I actually thought it was really neat that what what it had, what it had done, um, in 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 its in that form. So much so that when the completed video came out with all the graphics attached to it, I actually at first found myself liking the incomplete version that had the green screen in it more than the actual video. Now, that changed over time because I got used to seeing the regular video, and I think that really is an interesting and unique video. But I just remember how excited I was that we got a leaked Depeche Mode video, and it was actually pretty cool even in its raw state. TalkshowNerd at gmail.com is the email address. We've got a couple of uh, emails here. Uh, Chuck writes in, listening to last week's show, Hearing Dead of Night in that clip sounded great and gave me chills. Love the show, John. Alan better be uh, at the Hall of Fame. We need to do something to show the band we want album in the next album. Maybe produce it. That would be great. Yeah, and again, we'll 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 talk more about that because... Uh, um, Nebra songs, N I E B U H R songs, Nebra songs, um, mentions as well. Thanks for the shout out. Love the show. Looking forward to the Allen episode. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about that coming up and, and the idea of Allen working with the band again. 
that would be an interesting experiment. And and I'll get into it on, on another episode, but because um, it has the potential to not go well, right? Because expectations will be really high from the from the fandom. And there's a part of me too that feels a little bad because like if you were the band and you heard the fan really want Alan back, I mean, how would you take that? I hope the band would take it as, hey, we really love the music you've been making, but that era back then that we keep talking about when Alan was here, it'd be great to see you four band members because that's the core of when we were really all expressing our fandom, right? Okay. Um, Aurori Asmith Austra- uh, Austral, um wrote, and they actually wrote into my Star Wars show, but they added this at the beginning of their of their email to my Positively Star Wars show, so I wanted to share it with you. Um, slide off topic related to what you said about being a Depeche Mode fan. I love them too. Saw them three years ago. And I would love to hear from you, by the way, if you're a Star Wars and Depeche Mode fan, just because if you're a Star Wars, Depeche Mode and NASCAR fan, I really want to hear from you. But, um, I have the sneaking suspicion that I've touched upon something now, granted Depeche, uh, Star Wars is, has a massive fan base, right? It's ar- arguably the biggest IP in the world. Um, but that being said, I, I I wonder how many crossover fans there are of both Star Wars and Depeche Mode for the reasons that I was talking about on the show this week when it comes to um, mythology and how, whether you realize it or not, Depeche Mode also has a very strong mythology to it. Uh, so, again, talkshownerd at gmail.com or leave a comment up on YouTube. All right, uh, John writes this. This is John Justice with an H. Uh, spent several hours in the car and caught up on several of the Depeche Mode podcasts. So glad you didn't give up on the show. Uh, wish I had known you switched channels on, on iTunes. Um, yeah, I, I people were listening to me on Podbean, and I guess I didn't realize that um, I switched over completely to Spreaker. And so those that may have been listening on Podbean may not have realized that I had uh, moved on. But hopefully they found me by now. So many things to tell you. The day we found out that Depeche Mode was going to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I was so happy. Validation for everyone I know that likes our favorite band. I know 25 or more who don't. I found them in 1985 when People Are People hit MTV. I bought the Some Great Reward cassette using the Columbia House Record and Tape Club. And before long, I was buying Black Celebration, uh, Catching Up With, and the entire back catalog. Yep, sounds familiar. Uh, I've been hooked ever since. Uh, let's see. The next few sentences are going to be random. I want the uh, the box set mode. Yep, the Depeche Mode box set. But it's very difficult to find at the moment. I want it for the book of lyrics. Interesting. I loved Spirits in the Forest. Yes, I would like the entire concert also, but it was a moving film about fans of DM. I felt like I really connected with them. Interesting. I saw it twice in the theater and once at home on Prime Video. My dream for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which I'm going to try to attend, is that both Vince and Alan would join Dave Martin and Fletch on stage. They play Just Can't Get Enough Behind the Wheel, the Vince Clark remix, Personal Jesus Never Let Me Down Again, and then announce a world tour with Eurasia opening. (laughs) Lastly, it was great meeting you in person in Chicago. Yeah, man, it was for me, too. I wanted you to move up to where we were, but I could never get your attention. It was a great show. Keep up, keep uh, doing what you do, John. And again, that's John Justice, John J O H N Justice. And uh, yeah, I, I had a chance to to, um, to to hang with him and his significant other there, and it was a really um, it was a really cool experience. That whole night was, and I went there by myself, and so it was neat to listen to somebody. And John's been with the show since the very very beginning, uh, and I always appreciate um, I always appreciate his input and uh, and feedback. All right, look, that wraps up the show this week. And once again, I went longer than I thought, which always happens when I talk about Depeche Mode, because I'm like, you know what, I'll go in there and talk for a half hour today, and I end up talking for almost 50 minutes. If you want to support the show, um, I really hope that you'll take just a moment. And if you like science fiction, okay, if you like science fiction and you're listening to this show, then these books are perfect for you. Uh, I challenged myself to write a, to, to write a story. Um, I had a story in mind with sort of the, like I said earlier, um, with Fast and Furious in the background, um, with the idea that in the future on Earth, um, the car culture, the kind of car culture that you would see in Fast and Furious, is actually replaced by air and space flight. Everybody has the ability to to own and modify flying vehicles and getting your driver's license. Um, it's as easy to get a, a, a pilot's license to fly one of these, I call them T-crafts, traver, traverse crafts, as it is to go get a driver's license. And so the, the, the initial idea was create a story, um, a morality tale about good and evil set uh, in the future on Earth, because I'm a big Star Wars fan, but you can't do a galaxy far, far away because George Lucas has already done it. And have the premise be where, again, 
um, flight culture has replaced car culture. People have landing pads and uh, garages to store their ships versus automobiles. Young people customize their vehicles, right? Um, they're weaponized. I take a very, um, a very sort of uh, constitutional approach to the right to keep and bear arms that translates into weapons on vehicles. Um, I do that for a plot and story element, but Earth is thrown into chaos over a global industrial disaster. There's a hero that's in love with a girl who is also a massive Depeche Mode fan. And so there's a lot of Depeche Mode references in all the books that, I am, that I'm writing. Um, and this individual, Taft Guardia, that's the hero who's a Depeche Mode fan, uh, and the girl that he loves, uh, they stumble across a, a mystery that needs to be solved. And with their friend's help, they move to solve the mystery while... In the meantime, uh, planet Earth is in jeopardy. A corporate madman with a covert army at his disposal decides that with the global evacu evacuation to the stars taking place because Earth is facing Armageddon, he moves to exploit the disaster. And our heroes of the story, with their flying machines, are now thrust into the middle of saving humanity as they escape to the stars. I wanted to make a story that was simple in its storytelling standpoint of this is the, um, you know, this is the, this is the challenge they have to go through and this is how they're going to overcome it. That's what I love about the original Star Wars movie, right? Sort of its simplicity in that you, you know exactly how the story plays out and what the end game is. And that's what I wanted to make with my first book, Embark. And I feel like I really, do, I've really done that. Um, if you tried to read the book and maybe were bogged down by exposition at the beginning, uh, I am very pleased to say that I just released a second edition. I removed about 3,500 words from the book and took out a bunch of exposition from the beginning of the book and put it in a prologue. So the beginning of it moves a lot faster. One of the biggest complaints that I had over book one was that it was just a little bit, it was too slow to get into the story, but once it got going, everybody seemed to seemed to like it. So I fixed that, and the second edition is now available in ebook and in paperback. The book two, Treasure in Darkness, is also available. All book, all the books are available in ebook, paperback, and uh, audiobook. Purchase of the ebook gets you a massive discount on the audiobook. Right now, book three in the opening trilogy is being edited and should be out in the next two months. So if you haven't picked up your copy yet, please go and do so. That's how you can go and support the show. It would mean the world to me. If you have and you liked it, go and leave a positive review. I need all the reviews that I can get on both books. And if anything else, if you're not a sci-fi fan or you've already bought a copy, but you know somebody who is, support the show and gift it to somebody else. Two ninety nine for the ebook. How cool was how cool would it be to support the show? Hey, I got a guy, he does a Depeche Mode podcast, he's a science fiction author. I know you like sci fi. Here's an ebook copy of his book. Maybe you'll like it and find out a little bit more about Depeche Mode because the guy who the main character in the book is a massive Depeche Mode fan. All right, that's my pitch. I hope that you'll go to Amazon.com and search for John J. O. N. Justice and Embark and pick up the books. Uh, again, the third book, The Vanishing War, will be out in the next couple of months. And I'm already hard at work uh, work on books four and five. And I hope to turn these out a lot faster. I'm uh, streamlining the process of writing my, my, my novels. So I hope to have more out in the future so there won't be quite as long of a wait. Maybe just a couple of months. That's my goal. So help support me in doing that. And go to Amazon.com and search for uh, John, J-O-N, Justice, and Embark. And you can find the books there. Again, books one and two, it really would mean the world to me. Especially if you like listening to the show. Right? It's a great way for you to go and support it. Email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com. You can also join the mailing list. That's free. Email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com, and I'll put you on the mailing list. The mailing list is strictly for the podcast and the books that I write, not for anything else other than that. You will get no spam, I promise. Thank you so much for checking out the show again this week. We'll be back next week talking about Sounds of the Universe, and I can hardly wait. Have yourself a great week in this world we live in and life in general, and I'll talk to you again uh, real soon. Bye. Bye.